Hi, I'm Julian. I play in a punk band from Canada called Inhalants, and this is the next episode on my journey to try to build a very special instrument. So essentially, I'm trying to combine a bunch of different pre-built components into a very elaborate device that's part synthesizer and part stage production controller and part like retro sci-fi prop. The big gimmick is that the main source of sound and uh, the main computing element is a Game Boy from the 90s. I'm trying to make something beautiful and really unnecessary and extremely specific to my band. In this episode, I'm gonna go over my decision-making when it comes to the general design and how I, how I decided on uh, the current structure. Okay, so I'll start with my previous design because a lot of the decisions come from the things that didn't work with that prototype. Uh, it was entitled the Lame Boy 2.0 because the original Lame Boy was just a bunch of stuff stuck to some Velcro on a, on a wooden plank. But anyway, even 2.0 was a really simple layout where all the components were just crammed side by side. It had this little two octave MIDI keyboard. It had an arcade controller and uh, the Game Boy was just mounted on a plate. And then my bass amp, which uh, is sometimes played by the Game Boy, was just stuffed underneath it on the one side there. And there's a whole plate here on the left side that's just for the band name, because I didn't spend enough time actually designing the enclosure to accommodate everything in an efficient way. Instead, I just did some rough measurements and then tried to pack everything in. I ended up with extra space in areas where it wasn't useful and then not enough space in areas that needed it. Uh, the layout was super ugly and I didn't do any real planning of the internal routing, which as we'll find out later is extremely complicated. It was really important that I tried to build something though before I knew how I would want the final product to end up. So building that prototype was really educational. First of all, I decided I don't want this keyboard attached to the device. Two octaves is not enough to play anything real and anything bigger wouldn't even fit. So it was pretty useless to include it. I also don't play keys in any of our songs right now, but I might want to in the future. I decided to just make it possible to plug a MIDI keyboard into this thing if I need it, but not be stuck with it there all the time, especially considering I don't even use it now. I talk more about the previous design in the last episode, so if you're interested at what didn't work, you can look at that. After building something that didn't work, I needed a more surgical, like conceptual method to decide exactly what definitely needs to be included and what could be removed from the device. So I wrote out some fairly strict design requirements for version 2.1, which is what I'm working on at the moment. In product development, there's an idea called the minimum viable product, which is a way of categorizing design features in order of importance and having a clear understanding of which features are absolutely necessary for me to be happy with the project and uh, which ones aren't as necessary. And the first priority in the minimum viable product, you know, paradigm is functionality. You start from what does this need in order to be functional and then you move back from there in a cycle of iterations. Here's the list of my MVP categories in order of importance. Primarily, the sound has to be generated live by an actual Game Boy sound chip using LSDJ on a ROM cartridge. That means no backing tracks unless it can be triggered by the LSDJ song programming. A lot of people have said this is a stupid restriction. I could just use a pre-recorded backing track on a laptop and have a lot more freedom and control. But to me, if I'm going to do that, I might as well just remove all of our instruments from our live show. And then we can just, you know, dance around on stage with a backing track. There's like a magical synthesis to playing music live. And it's really important to me that this thing works as an instrument rather than a computer. So I want to have all of the challenges and limitations that come with using this thing. Uh, and I'm really interested in pushing the hardware to its limits. So the second requirement is that I must have only one power cable, one cable to connect the pedal board to the main console, and one cable to connect my bass guitar to the whole thing. 
this is really important because the whole reason I started this project was just to consolidate all of our setup and teardown before and after shows. It also has to be beautiful. This is pretty contradictory to the idea of a minimum viable product, at least for some people, um, because the aesthetic has nothing to do with whether or not something is functional. But because I'm on the third iteration of this project now, I know what works and what doesn't. And with this new revision, the aesthetics are finally uh, something worth considering. It also has to be easy to repair because things are inevitably going to break and I need to be able to fix them on tour. And it also needs some modularity and expandability so I can add new features in the future. And then lastly, it has to be able to take a beating. Uh, our shows get pretty chaotic and I'm not putting this much effort into something and then having your drunk boyfriend trip over my mic cable and crush it under his big fat beer gut. So it's got to be tough. And then there's one nice to have, which is in a best case scenario, I would have this whole thing with the flight case be less than 50 pounds. But I think that's pretty unlikely um, considering I'm going to be building it out of wood and the enclosure, like the, the flight case has to be pretty tough. But if I could do that, it would be pretty fantastic because then it means I don't have to pay extra when I fly with it and there's less risk of it getting lost on a, on a flight. And once I had those design requirements, I was uh, able to get started roughing some general ideas for the overall shape. It was an interesting challenge to understand how to start because I had all these pre-built components that I knew needed to be included, but I had to integrate them in, in a way that was aesthetically pleasing and also made sense functionally. It's really important that everything looks like it was designed to be part of this one thing. I don't want it to look like I just assembled a bunch of um, separate devices. I started making some preliminary sketches and tried to zero in on what the first design choice needed to be. I think a big aesthetic issue with the previous design was that it had no real focal point. It was just this smattering hodgepodge of different components. For the sake of balance, it needed a central focal point for your eyes. And I already knew that I wanted a bigger display for the Game Boy like video feed, because looking at the actual Game Boy screen from across the stage is pretty hard to see. So it was pretty obvious that if I did have a display, it had to go in the center. And then it also followed that the control stick should go in front of the display so that it was comfortable to use. And with those two decisions, I had my first design constraint. It also means the rest of the components have to go on either side because the display is in the center. So now I had some direction with this idea of a centerpiece and then two sides. And then the next thing that was difficult to fit was the base amp. So I went display, control stick, base amp. The reason was because on the old design, one of the least pleasing design choices was the placement of the amp. It's just crammed into the bottom right corner here. It also had a big influence on the depth of the last design because I tried to restrict the depth of the entire assembly to the depth of the amp, but that made it too shallow to fit everything else. So I spent a lot of time like sketching different ideas and trying to think of a, a way to incorporate the amp that actually made sense. But I had quite a bit of trouble until I had a nice bit of inspiration. I have a small collection of these old CRT TVs. Like this here is a Sony PVM, which stands for Professional Video Monitor. It was used in professional broadcast applications before LCD monitors caught up to CRTs. They're pretty sought after collector's items now, and you can actually see them on a you know, in a lot of old movies, like uh, this is from the set of Maniac. They have a bunch of them around the top. But if you look here, the controls along the bottom look basically exactly the same as my bass amplifier down to like the little rack handles. To me, that was, you know, a nice little message from God. I knew that the amp had to go beneath the display. I'm really excited about the way that came together, especially because in order to make the display look like a CRT, it has to have some considerable depth. It also meant I now had a constraint for the size of the display. It had to be close to the width of the amplifier. And then after deciding on the amp placement, I still had to consider the chaos pad, the Game Boy module, and the patch bay placement. Because I have to interact directly with the chaos pad, it had to be at a comfortable angle for my wrist. And that dictated the size and angle of the control surface on the side here. So again, that was the next most important functional choice. And then once I had that decision made, it meant I could just put the patch bay on the other side because it's a much more variable shape, right? It's just a bunch of holes so I can configure them however I want. I didn't realize this at the time, but I was basically working in order from the least flexible 
items to the most flexible, which generally happens to be largest to smallest. And so at this point, I had a lot of good constraints so I could start looking at reference material. And I'd been playing Alien Isolation at the time, so I dove through a lot of the set pieces in Alien. And then I committed to a particular design language with that retro future look. And that gave me even more beautiful constraints. Essentially, I think effective design can be distilled into just the pursuit of restrictions. That's kind of all it is if you think about it. So like if you figure out all the ways that something has to be, then all that's left is the ways that it can be. And that's where you get to be creative. You're excavating your way down through progressively less general layers of abstraction until you arrive at the most constrained situation, which is the final product. Once it's built, you can't change anything. So a particular design language is a very useful constraint because now when I come up against an aesthetic choice, I can consult all the reference material and then that informs my decision making there. So that's what I'm constantly looking for and it helps me move forward because I know the boundaries of each particular aspect of this project. And then the last thing I had to find a place for was the Game Boy module. I didn't really have a ton of options given that the rest of the general design was already decided. It also made sense that it went up here because I, I rarely actually interact with the Game Boy itself. It's all going to be controlled with the control stick, but it does need to be a separate module for repairability and modularity. And then I left the other corner unknown so that I had some extra design space for things I didn't account for. I've already decided what's going to go there, but I'll talk about that in another episode because uh, I think you guys will really enjoy it. It'll be something that uh, people can actually contribute to. And at this point, I had pretty much everything I needed to start the actual CAD process. I was finished with the first levels of abstraction, which is what I want this thing to do, how I want it to do it, and the way I want it to look. The next step is to actually go in and make everything fit based on the exact dimensions of the pre-built components. I'm gonna go over that next episode um, because this episode's gone on long enough. But in the meantime, I'd like to know what you guys actually think of the project so far, uh, what questions you have so I can make sure I address them in the next one. People brought to my attention a lot of things that I hadn't considered or uh, things I discovered and forgot that I discovered. So I hope the process so far has been enjoyable for everyone. I'm working on my uh, on-camera persona. And also the design process is not really very visually stimulating. It's a lot of me just showing you the 3D model because it doesn't exist yet. So once I get past all this CAD stuff and my design decisions, I'm hoping that these videos are gonna be a lot more entertaining because I can do a lot of footage of the building and. Um, that's what I'm really excited for. So I'm just trying to catch you guys up on my design and then I'm ready to get into the actual build process. So if you guys have suggestions or like I said, feedback for this format, please leave it in the comments. I would like to make this stuff as entertaining as possible. And other than that, good luck in everything you guys are doing this week and get fucked and listen to inhalants. <laughs>